associate professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at uh, Cornell. And uh, Michelle received her PhD at the University of uh, Washington in, in Seattle, where I think I read you work with flies. Yes. Yeah, okay. um, and uh, since then, she's been a uh, science teaching fellow and research associate in uh, at UC uh, Boulder. And I think it, it's at that point that uh, um, uh, she uh, began the, the transition over to a discipline-based education uh, research. And from there, uh, Michelle's had uh, positions at the uh, University of Maine then uh, more recently moving to uh, uh, Cornell. And uh, I, I point out a couple of other things about Michelle's uh, uh, background in terms of her, her research, or again, her discipline-based education research. There's been a couple of different uh, areas that she's focused on, and one is um, the, uh, the development of assessments, uh, uh, largely in the area of uh, biology, but also uh, work on a, a peer discussion as a uh, learning tool and also on the uh, instructor decisions, so uh, how the different types of teaching practices that instructors use and what influences uh, those uh, decisions. And then lastly, point out that uh, Michelle's an editor for uh, Course Source. And uh, for those of you that haven't explored Course Source yet, please do. It's an incredible repository of, uh, uh, again, for biology of, of labs and uh, other types of uh, information for uh, that's, that's really, uh, really useful. So um, I'll leave it there and turn it forward to Great, thanks. I'm going to try to convince several of you to be course source authors before the uh, hour is out as well. So thanks. Um, I really appreciate the invitation. It's really been nice to get to know the community. It's my first time to Winnipeg, and I'm glad that I get to see it in all of its winter glory. So thank you for sharing your community with me. Um, I just wanted to start, I have an advertisement here for the uh, Mobile Summer Institute that will be um, happening in April on your campus. I've been involved in some of these uh, across the country and they're really fantastic opportunities, so please check it out um, if you're able to. So today my talk is going to focus on using instructor collaboration to enhance student experiences. And I'm going to talk about how we're using this specifically to develop active learning materials for the classroom. And I'm going to first contrast this with an instructional approach that has been around a really long time. And that is actually what I'm doing right now, the lecture and having um, audience members listen. And I often put up this picture. It's a 14th century illustration. This is Henry of Germany delivering a lecture to university students. And you might recognize some features of university classes today in that you have some students who are chatting in the back, some getting a little bit of rest, and the first row hanging on every word that's being said. And so we still have some of these patterns today. And especially in the US, what we are finding is that we are losing a lot of students with this type of instruction. So only about 40% of students who are interested in a STEM major when they start college will graduate with a STEM degree six years later. Most of the students are leaving between the first and second years. And students who are underrepresented in STEM fields are leaving at even higher rates um, than their peers. And so there's been a revolution underway to try to change the way we are teaching to be more inclusive and equitable and attractive to a variety of students. And that's that we've used a number of active learning um, activities in our undergraduate classrooms. Now, active learning is a big catch-all term. I imagine even if we went around the room, we'd have slightly different definitions of what it is. Um, but basically, it's doing something where the students are engaged in the material, problem-solving, thinking, and learning about it, and then collecting evidence to see how it's working for them. And so it can take on things like quicker questions, where students are ask, answering remote, um, multiple choice questions with remote controls, Discussion questions, we've done this in rooms of hundreds of students where students are talking about a topic and then reporting back. And even worksheet activities where students are exploring ideas on pencil and paper, discussing it, and then we um, talk about it as a large classroom. So obviously when you compare the pictures at the bottom to the pictures at the top, you see it looks different, right? We've created a different type of environment, um, which is exciting. But the other big question is, well, are students learning anything from the new environment we are creating? So a number of years ago, I participated in a meta-analysis where we looked at 225 studies 
comparing active learning to traditional lecturing in science and math classes. So we didn't do all of these studies, we just collected studies that existed in the literature. And the typical way these studies were done is that um, an instructor would teach two sections of the class. One section would be traditional lecture, and the other would be active learning. And then they would look at common assessment and or failure rates in the class to compare the two scenarios. And we found two fundamental results about active learning. The first is that active learning decreases the failure rates. So the graph at the top, the red is lecture, the blue is active learning, and it's the percentage of the students in the class who are failing. So you can see that there are fewer students failing when we're using active learning materials. It also increases students' performance in undergraduate STEM classes. So the way these studies were done is that students either took a common conceptual assessment that was available nationally, or they had um, common exam questions that were drawn from a large pool of, of exam questions. And here you can see that students in the active learning classrooms perform better um, than students in the traditional lecture classes. So since we did this meta-analysis, there's been a few follow-up studies. It's been shown that course performance for all student populations increases, but there are equitable outcomes for underrepresented racial minority students and first-generation students um, that are increased as well by changing our practices. So all of this is great, right? We should all use active learning. But I don't have to tell everyone in this room the following thing, that it can be very difficult to develop active learning materials. It takes a lot of time and energy to do so. And so because of this, even though we might want to transform our classrooms, <laughs> it can be hard to do. And so what we wanted to do is try to create communities among faculty in order to make these changes. And so this project um, was done while I was at the University of Maine, so that's why you'll see University of Maine and not Cornell represented here. But we had faculty, the are biology faculty members represented by these gray dots, at five different institutions. And they formed what's called a faculty learning community, which is a community of practice that meets on a regular basis for an extended period of time. So for example, these faculty met on a monthly basis over a period of three to five years. So these faculty learning communities were focused on assessment, which is, of course, a broad area. Uh, we think about assessment in all kinds of ways in our classroom. But in particular, these faculty were interested in integrating short answer assessments into their large enrollment classes. So each of those faculty, represented by a gray circle in the previous slide, taught a really large biology course, so hundreds of students in front of them. And while they wanted to ask more short answer questions, that's really difficult if you've got hundreds of short answer questions coming in. So the way this project worked is that students were presented with a short answer question online, and I'll show you an example of a question in just a second. So they would log on, they would answer that question, and then computerized lexical resources would sort student answers based on their word choices. And the lexical resources would predict how an expert or the instructor in the class would score them. And then instructors would receive a report with the students' answers sorted into categories. Now the category is varied a little bit depending on the question, but generally the bins were correct, um, unclear, irrelevant, or incorrect. Now I'm sorry to say this does not replace grading. Um, it's a statistical model, <laughs> so the students' answers are sorted, but you wouldn't want to say replace this uh, with grading in your classroom. So here's an example of one of the questions we asked in a genetics class. So we call this the stop code on question. So the students would see a DNA sequence that occurs near the middle of the coding region of the gene. They would be told that there's a G to A base change in the position marked with an asterisk. And consequently, what's known as a codon that normally encodes an amino acid would become a stop codon. And then they had to answer how this change would affect these processes, which are part of the central dogma of biology. So DNA replication, transcription, and translation. Now, I know everybody in this room is not a biologist, so let me just quickly go through the answers here so we can all think about this in a similar way. So for DNA replication, the correct answer in the green text on the left is that there would not be an effect. So since during DNA replication, a nucleotide is read one at a time, the mutation will have no effect on DNA replication. So then conversely, the incorrect answer is that this change would cause DNA replication to stop. And I'll spare you all the unclear, irrelevant answers in the middle. But these were the contrasts we had between 
this question. So then for transcription, it's a similar pattern. So this stop codon won't influence transcription because RNA polymerase, which is involved in this process, doesn't read codons. And then the, correct, the incorrect answer in red is that the newly added stop codon will prohibit um, DNA from being transcribed into RNA and will stop. So we have a similar pattern between DNA replication and transcription. And then when we get to translation, it's, it's the opposite. There is an effect. So the correct answer is that translation will be halted when um, it reaches this premature stop codon. And then the incorrect answer is that it would be unaffected. All right, so if we look across all of these questions, here we have the student percentages in each of these bubbles. So the green at the top is correct, the unclear or relevant in the middle in yellow and incorrect. And so if you look vertically, that should add up to 100%. So you can see where the students were falling. So that was kind of interesting to see that only about 50% of our students, um, this is actually at the end of a genetics course, we're getting um, the answers correct to each of these questions. But what's more interesting is we could start to look at the patterns of student answers between the different questions. So we would see things that we would expect. So we would see students that would get it all the way correct, and of course we would see students that would be incorrect. But what was fascinating is when we looked across all of it, we saw a big mix. So we saw students bouncing all around these different questions, indicating that they had mixed models of understanding of this type of question. So we saw this in all of these different classrooms across these five institutions. And the faculty decided they wanted to do something about this. So the ones in STARS agreed to participate in a project where we would develop a lesson to help students with their mixed model thinking um, about the central dogma. So we started off with an in-person meeting. We actually met in the basement of the Detroit airport, which I wouldn't incidentally recommend as a meeting venue. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's where we were. And the group of people got together with their data and they looked at it and they said, all right, we want to develop a clicker-based activity. We didn't prescribe that. Um, the faculty were either already using clickers or wanted to use clickers and saw this as an opportunity to give it a try. So they wanted to do a case study. They came up with um, the idea to compare two brothers, Elijah and Liam. Liam has muscular dystrophy, and if you look at um, the X chromosomes of each of these individuals, they had some nucleotide differences between them. And so the activity would ask students to explore these different nucleotide differences. Now, many of us may have been involved in projects like this where you get a group together, and you're really excited, and you make all this progress, and then you go home, and what happens is that you forget, right? Everybody gets busy. It's really hard to continue working on the activity. So a postdoc in my lab, Karen Pelletro, took everybody's ideas from the meeting, began to expand them, and revise the activity. Essentially what she did is produce a first draft that everybody could then comment on. And we went round and round with comments, and we had a version we're called version one, and three faculty um, agreed to implement it in their class. So what did this implementation look like? Each of these faculty taught the DNA unit for their class, whatever that meant to them. We didn't control that whatsoever. They then asked the stop code on questions, those three questions you saw about DNA replication, transcription, and translation a few slides ago. They did the activity in class for a day. A week went by, and they asked the stop code on questions again. The students did not get feedback on their performance on the stop code on questions until the whole data collection was over. So we'll just label these two time points. This will be the pre-activity on the left and the post-activity um, on the right. And so then we analyzed the student pre-post data and some additional exam questions to see how they did. So here's what we found. So we have replication in um, blue, transcription in green, and translation in purple. The darker shaded areas are correct. The hash are the irrelevant, in, unclear, and the light color incorrect. And so we can see from pre to post, the students performed better, which was good. Uh, we can calculate something called a learning gain, which just looks at how many students were correct on the post compared to their potential gain or increase. So this looked pretty good, um, but would you all be satisfied with what, what we see here? Would you call this done? No, what, what don't you like about our, our data? 
Distance is not that much. And what about for transcription? Did we nail it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they have more unclear, and do we really make huge strides in their knowledge about transcription? No. <laughs> okay, so we did some things that were great, but we did not do um, everything that could be great. So what we did is we asked the faculty if they'd be willing to keep going based on the evidence we collected. So together we revised the lesson. We added some more clicker questions. So we took out clicker questions where students were scoring really high, and we placed them with clicker questions about transcription. And then we added some new visualizations about the mechanism with the various enzymes involved. So then we had five faculty who wanted to implement a new version, same protocol as before, and we're gonna call this version two. So now it's gonna be your chance to predict what we found. So my question to you is, what results do you predict when comparing the original version one activity to the revised version two? So talk about the answer choices with your neighbor and then after you've talked about it for a few minutes, we'll come together and vote. So talk with each other and see what you would think here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count to three and you can vote. Uh, you don't have to vote the same as your neighbor, uh, so everybody can make their own choice. All right, so one, two, three, vote. Oh, okay, good, I see a variety. So tell me what you talked about with your neighbors. Why did you pick your choice? You have to participate because it's an active learning thing, and I'll wait you out. <laughs> Anyone? Any ideas are good. Could we talk about the actual differences between version one and two? Yeah. And what was done differently, and if it's not different, then why would you expect differences? Okay. So, which answer did you go for? I picked three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Some additional material might result in different learning. Okay, other thoughts? Yes? We just discussed that with the revised version, maybe it's because we're incorporating more way of learning, but it would have helped. Maybe someone who was lacking the information on the transcription now would feel that, yeah, absolutely. It would be okay, great, thanks. Others? I saw a lot of threes, yeah. Yeah. Like that actually just asking those questions might have been really positive for okay. learning and by repeating them, it might have actually done harm. Okay, right. We might have made it worse or been able to break even. Okay. Great. Other thoughts? All right. You guys ready to see what we did? Here is what we found. So we have the pre to post. Again, the color scheme is the same. We have the gain at the bottom, so this is the new gain, and I'll put up the version one gain here. So you can see that we got higher gains on the revised version. But is there anything about this that maybe isn't, is this super convincing? What's different about this graph than the previous one? Does anyone see? Very little unclear. Very little unclear, yeah. What about the correct pre? Is it starting at a similar level? It's higher, right? So what happened here is this was the spring semester. <laughs> so the other data was the fall, and now we're at the spring, and it turns out the students are growing in their knowledge of central dogma, and in fact, we're starting with a higher pre. So we thought, ah, oh, okay, we should try this again the following fall. <laughs> so this time, over time, we got more and more popular. Eight faculty said they wanted to go for it. They were ready to find out this answer. And in fact, what we saw when we, uh, we just made minor changes between versions two and three. We reordered a slide and put in one organizing slide. And so here's what we saw with version three. The pre-scores are down, um, what we saw with version one, and I'll put the learning gains here. You can see that by making these revisions, in fact, we're seeing that students are coming up um, to be more correct with the post. And we also had a number of final exam questions in common that we used that were separate from this that the group wrote together to also show that student performance was going up over time. And so what's neat about this is we now had evidence of an activity that worked across these different classrooms to improve student learning on these topics. And I should say we saw patterns of similar gain um, throughout the eight different classes that used it. 
And so what these faculty could then do is they could publish their article in a peer-reviewed journal, which was mentioned during the intro, called Course Source. So this is a peer-reviewed open access journal for active learning resources in biology classrooms and laboratories. And so what's neat is now there are 25 authors from six different institutions who together have this co-authorship experience to add to their CV. Now, Course Source is supported by the National Science Foundation, but also supported by a number of biology societies who have contributed organizing learning goals and objectives so that each article is tied to a, an overall learning goal and objective theme. So it was nice because they were then able to broadly share. So one side of this is, of course, the activity that we were able to create as a group. But another question we had was, will faculty involved in this collaboration change in their instructional practices because they've worked together? We also were wondering, did we just take a bunch of faculty who already were doing lots of active learning and give them new materials? Or did we take people who had a variety of teaching philosophies and move them to trying more active learning in the classroom. So in order to answer that question, what we did is we observed the faculty teaching on the activity day. And then we also had two other times, one before and one after, that were randomly chosen that we would come in and observe. So each faculty had at least three observations. One of those times was during the activity. So we needed a protocol to look at um, what faculty were doing in the classroom, and we used the Classroom Observation Protocol for Undergraduate STEM, or COPUS. And the way COPUS works is it's just tracking instructional behaviors in the classroom. So at the top, we have what students are doing, and I know these codes are too small to read, but the top codes are L for listening, so like you're doing now. Individual would be individual thinking. CG would be discussing a quicker question like you were doing earlier with each other. And then the instructor doing, lecturing, real-time writing, following up, and so forth. The way you score um, classrooms with COPUS is that you divide the classroom into two-minute chunks. So you're coding continuously. It's just every two minutes you move on to the next line. And so you code what the students are doing and what the instructor's doing throughout the entire um, duration of the class period. And so, for example, earlier when you guys were discussing the question I had up, you as students would be coded as CG for clicker question discussion. As an instructor, I would be coded as CQ because I asked you the question. And then moving and guiding because I was moving throughout the classroom to hear what you were talking about with each other. So you can have multiple codes within these two minute time intervals. And when we look at the data, we can see differences in course styles. So here we have a lecture based course. 80% um, of the instructor codes are lecture. This instructor also posed a question and did some admin. And you can see the experience for the students is that um, 90 plus percent of the codes were listening and then uh, one of the students or multiple students answered the question posed by the instructor. But we see different patterns in classes that incorporate more active learning. So we'll see here that the instructor will do a variety of behaviors. So lecture, demonstration, following up, posing a clicker question, so forth and so on. And the students will have a variety of, of behaviors. So listening, answering questions, doing worksheets together, so forth and so on. Now, when we take the COPUS codes, we can collapse them into categories. So these are just the instructor codes, but we can see some codes would be associated with presenting, such as lecturing, real-time writing, showing a demonstration or video. But others would be associated with guiding, such as following up and posing questions, clicker questions. And these codes and guiding are often associated with active learning classrooms. So what we did is we used these collapsed codes to see what was going on in the classrooms of our instructors. So here's what we see on the non-activity days. So the percent along the x-axis is the percent of code. Each strip across is a different class observation. The purpley blue color on the left is the presenting, and then the reddish color is the guiding codes. So my question to you guys is, what do you think you will see on the activity days? Will there be more presenting codes, fewer presenting codes, or roughly the same range? People did what they always did in the classroom. 
So talk about it with your neighbors, and we'll come back and vote. Okay, so a lot of interesting discussion. So let's go ahead and vote. On the count of three, one, two, three, what do you think? Oh, good, still some variety. Great, so tell me what you talked about with your neighbors. I talked about the bottom one, and that's a no-activity <laughs> class. Um, yep. I'm impressed. Okay, so the bottom one seems to be okay. To, to me, not, not having been Cobus, but my, I think my activity ones are maybe in the top third. Oh, yeah, and, and this is just, we're just recording what, you know, what's happening. So, yeah. 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 I suspect there might be a, a shift to the left, so the, uh, the uh, courses where you already have a lot of guiding may not change, but the, the ones where there's not much going, that they might. Uh, yeah. Okay, so especially a shift at the top. Okay, other things. They all have the same materials. Do you think they'll all look about the same? <laughs> no? Why not? Any thoughts about why not? Does everyone think, even if you hand faculty the same thing, they won't do the same thing? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was just based on that graph. There's so much variation. Yeah. And they're not activity. Yeah. All right. So here is what we saw. So there was a shift. Um, and there are a few observations, because remember, we had three observations per faculty on the non-activity days. But in fact, we did see a shift. And we still saw a lot of variation, even among the faculty who are teaching. So even though they all had identical materials, they put very much their own uh, flair on what they were teaching that day. What's interesting, though, is we still saw learning gains among all of the students, despite the fact that we had this bit of variation. So this model is really interesting to us. And um, the faculty who are involved um, continued to work together and started to design other activities for their classrooms. And so what we wanted to do is mix it up a little bit and try to take it to another group to see if we could replicate some of these ideas. So while I was still at the University of Maine, there are a number of branch campuses around the state. And the university was encouraging um, all of these branch campuses to become part of one university. And so the idea was that for the intro courses that were taught, they all had to be interchangeable. But that's a pretty tall order to give to faculty who are teaching at very different places. And it was really hard to get started because the task was almost too overwhelming. So what we did is we said, could we do something similar where faculty will ask a similar assessment question and then we start to develop activities together as a way to get to know each other and work together. So in this case, um, we had the students take what's called Eco Evo Maps. Um, this is an ecology and evolution assessment. Um, it was given to introductory students at all six campuses. And I'll just mention that the leader for this was postdoc um, Mindy Summers, who's now a faculty member at the University of Calgary. So a little bit down the road from here. So EcoEvo Maps is part of a suite of assessments, um, general bio, molecular, EcoEvo Maps, and then physiology. And the idea behind these assessments is that they're given online to students at multiple points in the biology curriculum. So in the past, typically assessments are tied to a particular course, but this is looking across the whole major. And specifically, the timeline um, that they were designed for is that students would take the assessment at time point one when they came um, to the university. They would then take the assessment again at time point two after their introductory courses, whatever that means for your university situation. And then they would take them just before graduation. So you would have this time series we could see how the performance of students changes. So the idea about these assessments was to motivate faculty to discuss and come to agreement on the essential learning outcomes for the program. Also to consider how students will satisfy those learning outcomes, given that they often have a lot of choices in the courses that they can take. They can determine the cumulative impact of their courses. So instead of one faculty member assessing their course and another one assessing over here, in fact, we can broadly assess and have conversations together. And then pinpoint areas of improvement. So for example, we found when we gave this assessment at the University of Maine campus that there were things students learned a lot about. But they also did not learn much about a concept called genetic drift. 
And when we talked about it with the faculty, nobody had been emphasizing it in their courses. So having that data allowed us to really revamp across multiple courses where this concept was being taught. And then, of course, the other big reason that to have these is that accreditation agencies are looking for evidence that programs are collecting and responding to data. So if we can simplify things for faculty and they can have a set of questions that they can give out, then, in fact, um, that may help with the assessment process. So the Eco-Evo Maps questions look a little different from the central dogma question, the stop code on question I showed you earlier. In this case, um, students see a scenario and they read through that scenario and then answer questions. So we struggled a bit with how to design the questions. So we could have done multiple choice questions, but the, the concept assessment would have gotten really long because we would have had to set up all these scenarios with all these multiple choice questions and the reading was just getting too long for the students. We then thought about having a set of statements where students would respond true or false to each of them. Uh, multiple true false is what it's called and it's been shown to be about the equivalent of having students write out longer form essays. But then the problem is when we develop these assessments, we spend a lot of time interviewing both students and faculty about the questions. And we found especially in ecology and evolution, faculty did not ever want to say anything was truly true or for sure false. <laughs> and so we finally settled on having a version where it is likely or unlikely to be true. And what was nice about this is that it allowed people to focus on the broader patterns and not obsess over the exceptions. So now we're looking at what's the general trend, what's the general conclusion from it. So in total, there are nine question stems and 63 likely unlikely to be true statements. So when we, what we found when we gave this assessment across all of these institutions at the University of Maine is that students were really struggling with energy and matter. So every statement up here is incorrect. So 68% of the students incorrectly answered that plants directly take up carbon from the soil. So this is something you'll see, you'll often find videos online about this, that people almost have this image of trees sucking up the carbon and the dirt around them instead of having the carbon coming from CO2 in the atmosphere. 72% incorrectly said that the in carbon dioxide was providing the energy rather than the sun. And that misunderstanding um, continued into thinking about nutrients. So often you'll see with fertilizers, they're called energy boosters for your plant. Students were thinking that they were directly providing energy um, for the plants. So as a community, we saw these data across the different institutions. It in fact did not matter which institution the students were at. The scores were similar. And we also knew we were in various places throughout the state that needed to get to know each other because of this one university initiative. So in fact, together we wrote a lesson about some of the major industries in Maine, timber, potato, and we wanted an aquatic example of sugar kelp. And we walked through the roles of carbon dioxide, sunlight, and nutrients in photosynthesis for the students. In addition, it gave us the opportunity to think about escalating CO2 in the atmosphere and how that's not only affecting the individual photosynthetic organisms, but how it might affect industries in the state of Maine in the future. And we were able to measure using a variety of question types that students learned here as well. And so together, this group was able to have a publication in CoreSource, which was really nice for the university because they could then also highlight the fact that faculty were starting to work together across the state to come up with common resources for the students. So throughout these various programs, there's been a few critical lessons. And the first is when working with the groups, really taking this data-driven iterative approach. When we kept the conversations on the overall data that we collected, we made a lot more progress. When people were allowed to tell one-off examples in their classroom, it was a little hard for us to translate those broadly. So really sticking to the data was extremely helpful. Um, in every case, people always received their own personal data and the group data. So you were free to share your own personal data if you wanted or not, but everybody would have access to the aggregate data. The second was to minimize risk and maximize reward. So we interviewed all of the faculty after this and asked you know, what about this experience was useful to them. And what they said is that the possibility of failure was really minimized 
when they knew they were using materials that were well written. So we knew that the materials going out, each clicker question, each idea had been well vetted by all of the faculty. There were no typos in the slides, we were pretty sure when the whole thing was done. And so faculty had the confidence that they had these materials that they could teach, and then they could focus on the nuts and bolts of the active learning materials and have people to talk to about how do you orchestrate a clicker question? What do you do for voting? What do I do about the answers? And so they were able to free themselves to focus on some of those details because they knew they had these materials. And the other one that I think is a little hard for me, at least when I started, was that a little variation in practice was okay. When I first saw the COPUS data to see after even everybody had the same slides, there was so much variation, I thought, oh no, this is gonna be a mess. But in fact, we found learning gains among the students in all the classrooms. And so really allowing flexibility and for faculty to put their own spin on these materials has been really important and something that I've come to grow um, when thinking about this. So what are the future goals? What's next? Well, one of the things um, that I've heard in a number of institutions that I visited is that graduate students would like to get more involved in some of the curriculum design. But it can be kind of hard because in their TA roles, they're often handed what they should be doing or given what they um, need to conduct for the, the tutorial session. And so one of the things we started to do at Cornell is get graduate students involved in the curriculum design process. So every spring, including in just about a week, I teach a, a class for PhD students who are interested in teaching. They go through the process of developing materials for the non-majors evolution class that I teach in the fall. So they need to write learning goals, assessment questions, activities. And then we um, collect some evidence about the student learning in the class and I deliver the content um, the next fall. And as a result of that, we then have enough material to put together a course source publication. So last spring, the graduate students, um, they voted and they decided they wanted to write about a lesson involving speciation, it mostly focuses on giraffes, but given that these are ecology and evolutionary biology students, they included a number of examples. We taught this lesson in my class this fall. We have lots of evidence about what students learned um, about speciation, where they started from on pretests and where they ended up on post-tests and final exams. And we're just putting the finishing touches on submitting a paper to CourseSource as well. So it's something to think about to involve graduate students not only in curriculum design for the department, but teaching publications because now they can put this on their CV and highlight it in their teaching philosophy statements. So I will happily take questions. I'll just put up some of the acknowledgements I have here. Um, I'm very grateful to the National Science Foundation for supporting our work along with some internal grants from Cornell and Maine. If you'd like more information about biomaps, uh, here's a link. Um, we will be having some new data analysis tools coming up as soon as I can get them all approved by the Cornell IRB. I keep saying in a month's time, but hopefully I really mean it now. So by, by February-ish, it should be ready to go. And a special thank you to all um, the people that I've worked with on these various projects. Collaboration is the most fun part of what I do. So I'm happy to take questions and thanks so much for your attention. undergraduate students try to develop courses at all or I feel like you start you know earlier than <laughs> yeah, graduate students I have not personally but I know that we've had a number of course source articles come in with undergraduate authors and so we certainly welcome that um, I should have put up here we run um, things like writing studios and we've had undergraduates involved in that and it's been really nice often they've taken the class and come back as an undergraduate learning assistant and want to be involved and they have a lot of great insight so yeah very much, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Have you seen a difference or similar trend in uh, the learning games in different fields of STEM sciences, like in different faculties? Yeah, so I think a lot of it depends on the assessment that you're giving. Um, so originally, measuring learning gains, um, some of the first work with active learning came out of physics, um, looking at active learning and non-active learning classrooms. Um, so we can't, directly replicate the numbers that they have just because we're starting with different assessment types. But I think that means that when thinking about pretests, you want to think about a pretest that has a percentage that's not, you know, 2%, but also something that's in the 
30 to 50 percent range because you want to be able to look at growth um, from pre to post. So um, figuring out that balance can be really, really tricky. If you had to choose among those STEM fields, is there some one field that has really high gains or probabilities? Of yeah, I don't know that I could actually choose. Um, I think. You know, with each of these things, I think it's not only the assessment that matters, but the questions. So even when thinking back on the biomaps assessments, it's not the overall number gain that matters, but rather which questions are students doing well and which are not as a way to foster conversation. So even there, it's been tricky because occasionally we have requests from institutions to compare themselves to other institutions and we flatly told them all, no way, because we don't want to set up that kind of environment. I'm just wondering for the courses that you, um, well, with the faculties that were involved, uh, for those course of courses that you implemented, for example, in COPUS, uh, were, were any of these courses, did you notice if they're included with lab component or mm. not? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so in a separate study that I didn't show here, we did COPUS across a number of STEM courses. So it was, I think, all told 600 separate observations. And we saw the same range that you saw among the faculty. So we saw people from very little lecture to nearly 100% and everything in between. So that data set allowed us to address the question that you're asking, because then we had enough classes we could sort on a number of variables, including laboratory and no laboratory. There was no difference between the two. Um, similarly, recitation section, no recitation sections, no difference. And intriguingly, intro versus upper division, no difference. So a lot of people have this perception that upper division classes are more interactive and intro are more lecture. But we've also been working a lot on the intro courses. And so in fact, we're not seeing these different trends. So yeah, good question. Yeah. So in the first part, you were presenting this sort of work you've done of asking the students a, a fundamental question. Yeah. And then you did some activity to address those concepts and re-ask the questions and the students saw some change in outcomes. Yeah. Were you able to control for just simply repeating those questions some time period later? Yeah. Is that, is that an effect that you're seeing there irrespective of what activity you do in between? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, in fact, we have done a little bit of that. Um, it's tricky because students are learning at the same time, right? So to get a true control, what we would need to do is give it to students who aren't involved in the classes. Um, and then you have to figure, well, will instructor want to ask questions that aren't involved? Um, so the way we did it instead is we were able to replicate the same pattern across multiple classrooms at the same time. Um, again, they were using the same materials, but using some variation. But then we can't hinge the whole thing just on this one question. So that's why we embedded several final exam questions um, as well. So we had, and, uh, and also you have to take into account our students taking it seriously when they're typing in their answers online. And so that's why we added the extra final exam. And the students didn't know that was coming, but we had to get agreement among all the faculty to ask the same questions. And I think it turned out to be five or six questions. So we really had to see if people would invest in central dogma at the end, but yeah. Um, the other thing we also reported in the article are the clicker performance questions. So it gave an idea. We had students do an individual vote, talk to each other, and a group vote. So then we could report that evidence as well. But yeah. The, the larger group that uh, came together for, for, the, for the study saw, I don't know if that, if that funding is still there, but is, is that group going to stick together? I mean, is there a yeah. plan, or how do you plan to sustain that, that, that effort? Yeah, so the funding's done. <laughs> Uh, the groups, uh, it's interesting, um, you know, we were able to foster a lot of across campus uh, dialogue. I would say some of that's been maintained if people have disciplinary similarities, they now know each other when they run into each other in meetings. But what has been retained is the within campus communities, thinking about lessons, the um, regular meetings. Some, some of the communities are still meeting on a regular basis, even though they don't have funding or compensation to do so. Um, also, uh, if you look at the author list, there was a bit of overlap um, between some of the authors. So some of the ones who initially participated in the central dogma were the first to sign up when we wanted to do something across the state of Maine. So we thought about um, organizing and then branching off from there. 
I will say a number of the people on that original central dogma paper have now used this format to propose broader impact sections of their grants about ways to connect communities. So they've used the template that we did to recreate new, new groups. All right. If not, uh, remind everyone that there's a uh, reception uh, of the SSA lounge uh, right after we're done here. And once again, thank uh, Michelle for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you guys. So much.